Hello, everybody. Welcome to session four of the Wireshark session. This one, um, I was a little bit worried. I actually maybe thought I should pass this one up because this is arguably the most confusing and difficult topic when it comes to packet analysis. And as you saw from the thumbnail, or the, at least the slide that came up a few seconds ago, it's about congestion packet loss, round trip time. These are things, congestion window, congestion avoidance. These are things that we all throw around, but it's actually very, very confusing to a novice. And it's, uh, it's harder the more you know about it because there are multiple different ways that TCP has evolved over time to deal with ex this exact topic of congestion. So with that in mind, let's dig into this topic, uh, but keep, but Again, do keep in mind this that I decided to include this even though it says, you know, basic introduction to Wireshark because the topic itself is important. So you should have an understanding even at a basic level of what congestion means and how it impacts performance and how you can spot it. Okay. And then as you get more and more into packet analysis, protocol analysis, you can dig into it deeper. Each topic, in fact, I could probably spend 10 hours just on the topic of congestion and what it means. And clearly, I would have no subscribers. All of you would check out uh, as much as you like packet analysis. So with that in mind, I, I've taken some artistic license in how I'm going to explain this uh, topic that can be pretty dry um, if, you, if I'm honest. All right, so let's go to here. And I, you know, most of my sessions, <clears throat> I don't have a script. I just extemporaneously speak and uh, I, I rarely cut and it's one continuous shot and so you don't see you know where it's like like that when I'm talking um, so I don't know if I'm gonna edit that or I'm gonna just keep it in but when you stop and edit as much as you keep your head straight it, it tends to be a little bit off, right? And uh, so again, I, I don't, I just talk extemporaneously. I'm comfortable, I like it better. In fact, I like it better if there were audience uh, so I can get some feedback. But this time I actually had to write out a, 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 a syllabus, if you will, or at least table of contents because it is, it can be confusing and I didn't want to go down a rat hole on any particular topic. So I, I did this to force myself to concentrate and keep it at a level that makes sense. All right, so let's start off by talking about round trip time. It's easy. How hard can it be? I sent a packet and I got to re reply back through acknowledgments. We learned about acknowledgement, you know, saying you're, I'm expecting you to start with this packet, right? We, we talked about this in, in previous sessions. The problem comes in that TCP doesn't acknowledge packets. Think about that. Remember when we first started this, we said TCP is a stream oriented, doesn't understand about packets. It's just a stream of data going across and acknowledgement, cumulative acknowledgement that comes back that says, I've received this chunk and this chunk of data. N it never talked about packets because the sequence number doesn't identify the packet. And you might be saying to yourself, Hansang, what are you talking about? There's a sequence number right there on the, on the Wireshark TCP analysis page, how can it not identify? Well, simple. What happens if there's a retransmission? Okay, so let's look at a simple example of a packet going this way with a sequence number of 11. And then the acknowledge, and, and let's say the data is one byte. Okay, so again, sequence number is 11 and it's one byte. So the next expected sequence number, next expected sequence number is 12. And the acknowledgement number coming back this way should be 12. We can all agree on that. What if that packet gets lost and you have to retransmit? So you retransmit that sequence number of 11, this one byte data, and this acknowledgement may or may not have come through. So when this acknowledgement comes with acknowledgement number equal to 12, which is identical to this packet here, 
How do you know which one it was acknowledging? How do you know that? Well, you don't know that because in the acknowledgement header, we don't say this is acknowledgement for packet number 25 or whatever the case might be. It just says, I want you to start with pack, you know, the byte number 12 next time you start. And this is why it's called an ambiguous uh, acknowledgement because the because TCP has no concept of packets, it only acknowledges data. Okay, so let me repeat that because it's important. The acknowledgement number doesn't mean I got packets X, Y, Z. Even though we draw it this way, because it's easy conceptually, it's never about packets. It's about the data that's being transferred. So always keep that in mind as you troubleshoot. And so this acknowledgement number 12 here, when there's packet loss, we don't know which one it's acknowledging. Okay? We don't know. We just know that I never heard a re uh, acknowledgement, so I sent it twice. I sent it once here, and I sent it twice here. Okay? And I received one, maybe two, one or the other. These are all valid combinations of what that acknowledgement could mean. So what do we do? Now we're, we don't know what the round trip time is, and we know... We intrinsically know that if packets get lost, we should slow down, right? We'll talk about that in a second. So what do we do? Do we just ignore it? Do we say, only pay attention to round trip time if there were no packet loss? That sounds like a good idea, right? So in other words, so long as there's no packet loss, the acknowledgement is not ambiguous. We know exactly what data it was representing because we didn't retransmit, so use that. And that's where Karn's algorithm kind of kicks in and said, yeah, go ahead and ignore it. Sorry, shouldn't have touched the microphone there. But it turns out that wasn't enough. Because if you, again, this is why it can take be 10, you know, 10 uh, hours on, or 10 sessions on this topic alone. In Karn's algorithm, if you just ignore it, there's still a corner case where it goes wonky. Okay, it goes off the rails. So initially what Karn's algorithm said was, okay, let's ignore the retransmissions, but let's back off on our timers. Okay, in other words, let's throttle down and throw out some of these outliers, but let's go ahead and back off as well. And so that's kind of the state of modern TCP. There's been improvements to that. Uh, so some of you might be screaming at the screen and at the screen and me at, right now saying, TCP timestamp solves that problem, TCP timestamps, and you'd be right. But TCP timestamps wasn't always there. And even TCP timestamps has limitations, okay? But that's for a later topic when we get to the more advanced part of it. So how do we detect packet loss? Retransmissions. And retransmissions messes with our round trip time calculation. It's important because there, these are all timers that are interrelated, right? Our retransmission timeout is based on the round trip time. And if the round trip time can't be calculated accurately, we're in trouble. Okay, and, and again, there are multiple e examples of where the congestion or the retransmission timeout goes to infinity or it just becomes tiny and just goes crazy and, and whatnot. So you can read about all of that if you dig deeper. So let's talk about the main topic, which is congestion. Again, we, we understand congestion. We experience it every day. You know, there's been one of my favorite shows, um, Stein Seinfeld, as you know, or may not know, talked about nobody beats the Van Wick. I live not too far from Van Wyck Highway, and and you're right. There, you know, actually, truth be told, if and if you're a New Yorker, you know this. The Belt is probably worse than the Van Wyck. Nobody beats the Belt Parkway. Never mind Van Wyck. But we understand congestion. N systems, the guy that's transmitting to he, you know the PC here and the server here, doesn't. They never experience congestion. You know why? because Ethernet has no feedback. Think about that. The congestions always occur when there's a system of routers along the path between the PC and the server. I have a gigabit interface. I can transmit at gigabit rate. That's what the rules are. And I can receive at gigabit. So therefore, I will never experience congestion. However, the very first electrically connected, cabledly, cabled connected switch 
has could experience congestion. Okay, so again, the syst end systems don't know about congestion, and if you read, you know, all due respect to Comer, I have it right here, by the way, this book right here. Oh, is it mirrored? I'm not sure if it's mirrored or not, but. People will say, oh, that's what ICMP source quench is about. And if there's congestion, this router here should send a ICMP quench message saying, hey, slow down. But that never happens. I've never seen it. I've never in my life have seen an ICMP source quench. And I've been doing this a long time. Why? Because people don't want to send unnecessary message. And there was a time when even all ICMPs were blocked because they were thought to be bad. That's a whole different topic. But again, what I'm saying is that router's way of telling you there's congestion stinks. Okay, so TCP has to do it on its own. So what came out of that were these two topics here called slow start and multiplicative decrease. Okay, not only is it kind of a complicated topic, it's a hard word to say too. Multiplicative decrease. So what does that mean? All right, so in, in broad terms, slow start says, don't just go from zero to 100 miles an hour by smashing down on your accelerator. Get a feel for how much the network as a whole, this system of routers and switches can take the data. So you, you trickle the flow of data out. Those of you that have some experience with plumbing or working with um, closing out valves and turning it on, what do we always do? We turn it on slowly because we don't want to introduce pressure into a system super fast because guess what? Chances of a blowout is pretty large. So when we work on our pipes at home and whatnot and, and you close off the valve, the main, and when you turn it on, no one cranks that up, Not at least not anybody intelligent. They'll slowly introduce uh, the water into the system. And TCP does that exactly, and that's why it's called a slow start. But slow start is a little bit kind of, um, it's a misnomer because it's not slow at all. So let's look at a general example of what TC, uh, slow start looks like. And everybody knows, right? We start with one, again, I'll go back to packets because these are units of data, but from an explanation standpoint, packets are easier to conceptualize and to talk about. So we send one packet, and if that checks out, what do we do? We get the acknowledgement back. So that means that one unit of data, that one packet worth of data, made it all the way across. So then we send two packets of data. Okay, so we, we now have uh, packet one, one and two. Not This is not a retransmission, this, this is just units of data. And then if we get an acknowledgement for that, we can send more. So we can send one, two, three, four units of data. And once those four come back, we can go to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if that comes back, we can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you can see how one, two, three, four, five steps in, we're at 16 um, packetized data worth of transfer. So it's not slow at all. Of course, there's round trip involved in each one of these because we have to wait for the acknowledgement to come back. So that's why it's called a slow start, okay? And uh, again, it's not that slow, but it is slow. But that wasn't enough. So what they added was, okay, we need to do something because if there is packet loss, what used to happen is we would throttle all the way back down to this state. This is um, the analogy that I can give you is if you're a stick shift driver and you remember, well, this happens in modern day cars, you just don't realize you're doing it. But imagine going on a freeway and you have to come to a dead stop. Well, guess what? You can't be in fourth or fifth gear or sixth gear. You have to downshift to one. Then you go to second gear, third gear, fourth gear. So that's what this is. This is the first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, and this is the fifth gear. But that's because you came to a complete stop. And it takes a long time to go back up to top speed in gear number five where you're cruising. So modern day TCP stack says, wait a minute, let's not go all the way to zero. That seems, that seems like it's a silly thing to do. Let's just, the multi, 
multiplicative um, decrease says go down half. So instead of going from 16 to 1 here, let's go down to here, which is a halfway point. Okay, and and essentially what we're saying is from fifth gear downshift to third, coast there, then start moving up again. Okay, and that's what how the the congestion windows work. Also, I wrote down here, here as you'll see, that it's the minimum between receive window and congestion window. What does that mean? Well, I just told you about how much packetized data we can send when there's packet loss, right? So I have to be aware of that. But I also cannot forget about this receive window size. Remember, the reason why there's a word min here is that I'm taking the minimum of the two values. If the window size says four, meaning, again, four packetized worth of data, whatever that turns out to be, and my congestion window says, uh-uh, no, you're still in second gear, you're in penalty box, you're still in second gear. The other guy told me I can send four units of data, but I can't. Why? Because I'm in a penalty box and I'm in second gear. So I can, I can rank, um, ramp up, but I have to take the minimum of the two. So this is TCP has to always to worry about, should I send the full receive windows worth of data or are there limiters to that? And yes, the receive window size goes down as the receiver receives data. Remember the, the patient going into the doctor's office to be buffered? So it's always the minimum between the receive window and the congestion window. Keep that in mind. All right. Now, the other thing is, so that's how just um, slow start and multiplicative decrease works. We don't go straight to zero again. We, we go to a halfway point. The other thing is congestion avoidance. So that's the final topic that we'll talk about because we're already 17 minutes into this video. So congestion avoidance says at some point, okay, so whether it's one, two, three, four, five, or I'm not going to draw out all these circles. Maybe you're up to 32 packetized worth of data. Maybe it's 64. Who knows? At some point, we don't have limitless wire rate Ethernet. No matter what Verizon FIO says, saying, oh, yeah, it's a dedicated gigabit fiber, they don't run fiber all the way to Google for me. Okay, I know that for a fact. It's At some point, you come to a backbone, and, and it's a shared medium. So the newer TCP says, okay, let's go into congestion avoidance, meaning once we reach, reach some state, okay, I'm not even going to get into that yet, Let's say this is where we start to think about congestion avoidance, right? When we get to these four units of data. At this point, let's not be stupid and just double and double and double, okay? Let's increase it by a smaller unit because we know we're gonna hit a brick wall, right? We, we, it's, it's not a limitless uh, resource. So the congestion avoidance says, simmer down now, that's why I have this, where it's simmered down now is once we reach reach a certain point as determined by the, the stack and operating system, we don't just blindly double the rate of transmission. We reduce it to just one at a time. One more, one more, one more, one more. Okay, and that's because we know there's gonna be congestion, so we try to avoid it by being less aggressive. Does that make sense? It may not, and that's okay. For me, maybe it's just me, uh, I had a hard time conceptualizing what congestion, congestion avoidance, congestion window, the back off, all of that, how it impacted performance. And one of the reasons is because you can't see it. There's no value for congestion window. There is no value that says, oh, I, I'm at this state here. I'm at, you know, stage second gear, third gear, fourth gear. It's, it's, it, it does, it's not exposed anywhere. Maybe that's why I had a hard time. But what I would recommend is for you to pick up a textbook like this or Stevens and read. And you may not understand it, but read it again and read some other articles and then re read some other helpful tutorials because we can all Google, right? And as you do this over time, a little bit of this topic will sink in one by one by one by one. And then you'll go, aha, now I get it. Now I know how to 
heuristically determine what the congestion window might be or what the impact is when there's slowness because I can read that congestion happening on the road and I can A, try to avoid it and B, when I do crash, I know what my reaction should be. And really, again, this remember when I very first started out, I say this is like a detective trying to get a murder conviction without a body. When you see Stevens graph or TCP trace graphs of the world, you'll see these, you'll be able to plot that chart and be able to react and say, oh, I think this is congestion avoidance, which is perfectly normal, okay? Because I know what congestion avoidance means. I may not know when it kicks in, but I know what the behavior looks like. So I can say, throw that out. That's not a red herring. The system didn't slow down. That's just TCP doing its job. And this is why it's important to understand the topic of congestion. I know it was dry. I know it was boring. So if you're still with me, then there's one thing I wanted to say, which is, by the way, why am I wearing orange, which is meant for Q&A on a Wireshark session? Because I was doing two videos, uh, the Q&A. There was, there was some worthwhile questions that I wanted to go deep into, but I failed to hit the record button. <laughs> so... It's really hard to do a YouTube recording when you don't actually record the, um, the session. So that's why I'm in orange and I didn't feel like doing a wardrobe change. That's what we call it in the business, the talents, wardrobe, uh, wardrobe change. So that's why I'm wearing orange, even though this is a blue wire sh shark session. Okay, the big announcement, if you're still with me, is uh, starting next session. The next wire shark blue border session is we're going to hit actually hit Wireshark. I think we did enough of the overall concepts and uh, now we're gonna start digging in to actual packets. So let people know, we'll, we'll set up, we'll go through setting up Wireshark. So again, it'll be, remember I said this is, I'm very focused on making this beginner to advanced session. So we'll talk about how to set up Wireshark, what Wireshark is trying to tell you, um, what does a bracket mean, what is a, you know, so we'll go into all the semantics of what Wireshark is presenting to you so you understand that and how to use it, how to use the UI. And then we'll go into um, regular packet analysis. So we're close. Okay, so thanks for sticking with me. And sorry this video was late, but again, I had some uh, problems. You can't see it, but right there, there's a record button. And I didn't hit that. So here we are. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a great weekend.